It's time now for the award-winning number one local talk show in Northeast Pennsylvania, The Sam Lissette Show. Now here's your host, Sam Lissette. Well, folks, he's been living in Europe for 30 years. Uh, he was born and raised in Hazleton, Pennsylvania. He's an author. He's an artist. He's just one great guy, and I'm talking about Mike Apicella. For those of you who do not might know Mike Apicella, uh, in the uh, Hazleton Standard Speaker, he has a column, uh, maybe twice a month, fabulous column, talks about the town he was raised in. And today we're going to have a good old-fashioned conversation. Michael, first of all, it's a pleasure meeting you. I've never Sir, met thank you. you. It's a pleasure to be here. I, I've got to force myself to say, Sam, I want to call you Mr. Lasant. <laughs> Well, listen, uh, I, I was telling you before, I really enjoy your articles, uh, you know, the column that you write in the Standard Speaker. But let's talk about y you, Mike, and, and you know, uh, your career, uh, born and raised in Hazleton, and then you, what, you know, what did you do? Well, uh, you know, the funny thing about growing up in Hazleton, as everybody knows, we're surrounded by mountains here, there are rivers, there are streams. I, I grew up fishing in a lot of those rivers and streams, swimming in them, and looking at interstate highways and, and those mountain ridges, I always wondered what was on the other side of those. And uh, when, I come, when I came of age, uh, I began experimenting. There was a man in town in those days, many people watching this program will remember him. He was Mr. Joe Cortez, his family from Wyoming Street. They ran the, the laundromat and, and Cortez's bar. He himself was a postal delivery man. Uh, he told his son John Cortez and me one time, how he had hitchhiked from downtown Hazleton to San Jose, California, and back. Now, this was well before Jack Kerouac and, and you know, the, the mystique of on the road. And he just planted the seed. And, and I ran away from Hazleton at 17 and went up to Canada. And just to show you how ignorant I was, I didn't realize they spoke French up there. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I, when I got back to Hazleton and, and my mother punished me severely, I made it a plan to make another road trip, and that's what, where the bug came from. Uh, I started traveling. Now, uh, you, you went to um, Hazleton High School, of course, you graduated in 72, along with my sister, Rose Lee. A very bright and a wonderful, wonderful person. Everyone loved your sister, oh, Rose Lee Lassant. Yeah. You know, I think I might have even asked her for a date, and she said no. That's <laughs> yeah. how nice she was. She knew not to go out with a lowlifer oh. like me. <laughs> that would have been having you for a brother-in-law, I don't know about that. Um, Mike, so uh, your education, I mean, you went uh, to which college did you go to? Well, uh, some people might remember my father, Frank Apicella, and his brothers, Johnny, Joe, uh, and his brother-in-law, Tim, and uh, uh, they were all at Mount St. Mary's College, were all athletes, and that's where I went for my first year. Um, there were uh, no athletic programs uh, except for intramural then, so I gave up sports at that point. I took up rugby. We had a little rugby down there. And then I transferred to Kutztown State Teachers College, as it was known then, because I wanted to be a teacher. Mm -hmm. And Mount St. Mary's teaching program was, was, it was really known as a seminary, really. It's mm -hmm. for making priests. And I had given a lot of thought to being a priest at one time because my, fa my father's oldest half-brother, Nicholas Pecci, was a Catholic priest up in Kingston near, near Scranton, Wilkesboro, and uh, he was sort of grooming me to be a priest. But after a year down there, mixing with the seminarians and just knocking around, uh, I decided to be a teacher. I went to Kutztown, and ironically, Kutztown had an overseas studying program. I spent time as an exchange student in England. That's how I got to England. Mm -hmm. I did it twice. I did my uh, uh, studied over there, and then I went and I did my student teaching over there. Mm -hmm. Now, you're married to have five children, right? Yes, I am. Um, you're living in Cambridge now, correct? Cambridge is a wonderful ancient university city, uh, and uh, I often say in my column, when I'm walking around looking at the original Tudor buildings and the original Gothic buildings, I'm, I'm looking at the, the, the originals, but I'm thinking of the buildings in this town, which are the architecture, our Hazleton High School, is, is a Tudor, a mock Tudor building. Mm -hmm. And so you're seeing seven and eight hundred year old buildings that look like the high school. And you're seeing uh, seven and eight and nine hundred year old buildings that look like the old St. Gabe's Church. So yeah. in a funny way, deja vu is like a middle name to me. Uh, yeah. So I feel very content there and very happy in the midst of all this beauty because it was all here growing up. You know, um, when you're talking about 
um, what you write about a lot when you're talking about people, foundations is, is so important in life. Our foundation, our families, our friends, our communities. Um, uh, how much, uh, and I know the answer, but for our viewers, so uh, our viewers can get an appreciativeness of, of why it's so important to have such a strong family connection, such a, you know, community-oriented, uh, you know, your neighbors and, and growing up with people and, and sharing whatever you can share. Well, you, you've heard it said it takes a village to raise a child. I, I personally don't believe that, but if you come from an ethnic family, Polish family, <laughs> Irish family, Catholic family here, and if you grew up in Hazleton, you were aware that you had cousins on every other side street, mm -hmm. and they had friends were always looking out their window. So that kind of extended family kept us from really getting deeply into whatever mischief was available in those days. There was no such thing as drugs, particularly in the early to mid 60s here, but you could, there were places where you could buy beer, you know. Mm -hmm. And let, let me go on record. I drank beer in college, but I swear I did not swallow. <laughs> but you get my point. You, you knew if you got in trouble, you wouldn't get home before your mother knew because yeah. someone would be on the phone to you. Mm -hmm. That's part of what I think in response to your, your question. But it also gives you an identity. I work for a family man, you know, Mark Catcher, who is the editor. Mm -hmm. He's got four children of his own. Men need to be respons held responsible. You know, we'll be perpetual teenagers. I would have been a teenager forever if I didn't have five kids. I mean, I had to take jobs that I didn't want mm -hmm. at different times because uh, the kids needed to have milk and bread, you know, hard times. Mm -hmm. And this is good for men. Men should be married. Mm -hmm. Well, the the thing that I uh, I was born and raised in Partiesville. Yeah. Okay. I'm very proud that I was raised. So you in, should be. Yeah. Uh, the town was, uh, you know, we had Polish, Slovak, Italian. We all got together. We played, you know, in the streets. Uh, and you you can't find better people um, in these small patch towns. Now things do change after a while, but uh, I know coming to Hazleton was like going to New York City. I mean, it was a it was a feat. Sure. But you had your neighbors, we never locked our doors. Could you really? imagine? I mean, we never had to mm -hmm. lock our doors. And you had the porches, people got together. How important today with families, you mentioned about Mark, he has four, four children, right? Four children, Mark? This is why he's always looked, he always looks so tired yeah. to me. <laughs> they, he's, he's never Garrett tired. Um, <laughs> and he's half my age, what? <laughs> How important is, is that communication that you have, that you should have with your, your family and, and, and your upbringing and, and your, your neighbors, et cetera? Well, once again, we, we remember we had porches and people were always together and you always knew, you know, if you needed bread or sugar, there was, it was always a, you know, a, a exchange. Well, you know, there's another factor there that you didn't touch on, but I'm sure you would and I'm sure you would agree with me. There were the churches too. Oh, yes. And the, the, the number of times, you know, when a parish priest would know that a family was hungry and would arrange to have a food parcel come. I mean, that's part of it too. But having children, uh, they ask such direct questions uh, and you have to be prepared to answer some of these questions. And I think that's a good thing because we, we sometimes uh, fool ourselves and we forget what it's like to be a child and we go on to some sort of holding pattern. And you can't do that when you have several children who are asking you hard questions. I'm talking about, for example, when my daughters came up to the age of dating, uh, I knew that they were going to have to face the sexual revolution problems, you know. And uh, I remember my eldest daughter, uh, Maria, saying to me when she was all of about 12, she was going to her first party. And I learned this in Hazleton. I, I could honestly say I probably learned it from guys like you because you were just a few years ahead of me. She said, Daddy, how am I going to be popular at this party? Now, there would be some girls there who would do drinking and maybe do some necking and then maybe go up an alley. And I didn't want this for my daughter. I said, honey, the way to be the most popular girl at this party is just ask people questions about themselves. Oh, that's a nice pin, Sam. Where did you get it, for example? So, and you know what? She was one of the most popular kids at her high school, and that's because she was always asking questions. And, I think, like me, she didn't manufacture being interested in people. We're just nosy people. I'm a lot like you, Sam. Well, you know, what are you sitting here interviewing me for? I, you, I get the feeling you're actually interested. <laughs> I am very You learn that from being in a family. Yeah, if you're yeah, not yeah. in a family, you don't learn to share. You don't learn to be interested in other people. You, you're not interested in other people's needs. In a family, that doesn't cut it. Well, a person once told me, uh, Mike, nobody has a monopoly on ideas. 
Who told you that? Uh, a good friend of mine. <laughs> I, I believe yeah. it. Yeah, and, and really, you can learn a lot from anybody, sure. okay? Uh, you don't have to be, you know, a doctor or, or uh, you can learn something from that person who is on the streets, sure. okay? Uh, they could, you could learn something. And, and I think that's the way my father and mother raised me in, in, in Rose Lee, is to respect people, okay? And he always told me, which is not um, uh, rocket science, he says, uh, Butchie, look, you treat people the way you want to be treated. Uh -huh. That's all. Right. And, and, and if you talk about somebody that's not right, when you hear that someone talks about you, don't get offended. Because you did that, uh -huh. so uh, that's what I'm saying about foundations. Yeah. And okay, and of course we, we, you know, I still go to church, and and you know, we have a religion. No matter what the religion is, have a faith. I think sometimes people are not have that faith like they used to have it, Mike. You know, and I think it means a lot for family uh, gatherings or, or, or raising your children. Well, well, I can tell you this, Sam. Um, <coughs> over over 150 years ago, uh, after Darwin, when the churches began to lose their power over entire communities. If you know a little bit about the history of Western civilization, and we became secular, they began predicting that by, I think it was the, the, the ballpark figure was by the year 1960, the churches would be extinct. Well, what, wait a minute, last time I checked, the churches aren't extinct, and they're still on the street corners. And what I think is there is a fundamental need deep within the psyche of every human being, whether they're cave dwellers, daubing red paint on the wall, you know, to ask, to invoke the Great Spirit's assistance with, with capturing the deer, or whether it's you, Sam, uh, kneeling and crossing yourself and praying, or maybe uh, somebody over here at the, the Aguda Israel Synagogue uh, singing uh, the, the ancient Psalms. It's, we're hardwired for that. We, we walk away from it, but as we get older, now I, I just, I'm coming up to 61 now, I find, although I, I, I have to say this about myself, I probably, probably believe a, a great deal more about a great deal less when it comes to faith, mm -hmm. but the faith is there. Mm -hmm. And that's what makes me tick. Uh, folks, I'm talking to Mike Apicella, and uh, you want to learn more about Mike, uh, you can always Google him. But also he has a column in uh, the Hazleton Standard Speaker. I enjoy it, I enjoy reading it. We'll be back right after this. Welcome back to the Sam Sancho, folks. Remember, 24-7, every one of our programs you can watch on the Internet anywhere in the world uh, at ssptv.com. My email is sam at ssptv.com. I'm interviewing a person who is really very, very well informed of what's happening in, in our society today, Mike Apicella. Uh, and if you want to know more about Michael, I highly suggest you go to his uh, website michaelapicella.com or just google him it's a-p-i-c-h-e-l-l-a and michael is an author he's an artist uh, and he writes uh, a column in the hazelton standard speaker uh, maybe twice a month which i enjoy reading uh, michael talking about you know your um, how we we grow in life and how we you know one thing that i think uh, when you grow up in a neighborhood you meet friends uh, then you go on in life and you either become, you know, an author or an artist and you move in different things. But you never forget about your roots, okay? Because you're, in your articles, you write about your roots. Now, when you, you did write, you have written a number of books, yes. okay? What are some of those books that you've written? Are they, what, what, tell me something about Well, it. it's an interesting thing <coughs> to, to break into writing. And there are probably plenty of people watching this program that do want to write a book. And they don't want to self-publish. None of my books are self-published. They're all with reputable international uh, publishing companies. Uh, I had uh, uh, been invited after I earned a master's degree in journalism and mass communications to ghostwrite a sex manual for a company. And, uh, a sex manual? Yeah. <clears throat> you know, it, it's not pornography. It's, mm -hmm. you know, for dealing with dysfunction. I'm not the, it wasn't my book. It was a psychologist who couldn't write to mm -hmm. save her life, mm -hmm. but her ideas mm -hmm. were brilliant. So it, it came to my desk, would I write this book under her name? And I said, sure. I was hard up. I needed money. Uh, I was in between things. So uh, I began working on this. Uh, I should say this was the second book uh, offer that came my way. I took it. And I went back to the author, I said, this woman who is very knowledgeable isn't giving me enough information. I'm spending an awful lot of time doing her research. And I thought the guy would say, well, hit the road then. We, we could find 10 more guys like you. And he said, well, do you have any ideas for books? Which I wasn't expecting, Sam. 
you know, normally you have to come begging these people. I said, well, actually, uh, I'll get back to you. I went yeah. home and I told my wife what happened. She said, you know, the typical fish wife, get back there and tell them anything. <laughs> I went back and I said, yeah, I, I do have an idea. I want to write a book about failure, which personally, Sam, I think is the best teacher. And they were intrigued, and my first book uh, was a book on why failure is a good teacher. Mm -hmm. uh, and that book went into a second uh, version, and it's called Why Me, Lord, subtitled Advice from a Successful Failure. Say moi. Uh -huh. I am a successful failure. And anybody who knows me well knows exactly what I mean by that. What do you mean by that? Well... I have had a lot of failure in my life. I, I failed in a lot of personal ways, and I failed in a lot of professional ways, and I failed in, in many, many uh, uh, projects that I started and finished. But unlike your average schmo, instead of shrugging my shoulders and kicking the ground, this is the Hazleton way, I, I, I said to myself, well, what did I learn from that experience? And as you get older, you begin to say, well, I know how to do that now because I made 12 attempts before and I failed. In fact, there's a famous uh, saying, Thomas Edison had tried a thousand and one ways to invent the, the, the filament light bulb, and they all failed. And uh, someone asked him, are you discouraged by all the failures, the, the, all that time you spent on those failures? And he said, no. He says, I, I can say without fear of contradiction, I now know a thousand and one ways how not to make a light bulb. There you go. And that was my attitude. So I put that in my book. You know, mm -hmm. if you have a broken marriage, which I don't, thank God, I've been happily married to Judy, my English wife, for over 34 years now. But if you have failed career, failed projects, you can either use that to your advantage by learning from your failure, or you can use that as a handicap and excuse from trying again. There, there's my book. You don't need to write, read or buy my book. That's just, the substance right there. I find it very interesting uh, because you're, you're talking about your life experiences, mm -hmm. all right? And, and that's uh, so good. Uh, I'm going on 41 years of marriage, okay? Congratulations. Uh, uh, and, uh, yes, and, and I feel like we just got married l last week. Um, well, I've and, seen your wife, and I can uh, imagine why you feel uh, yes, that. She's a very she's, pretty lady. She's, she's what does she see in a guy like I you? I have no idea. <laughs> I have no idea. But she's brilliant. Um, she's a registered nurse, but also produces with me here, and, and she has her own show. Sure. But what I'm saying is the... To your experiences in life, okay, people say, what is it? How come? Well, we've had our arguments. There's no question about well, who that. Hasn't? But I'm, I'm writing a book, okay, uh, and uh, I've, I've been threatened with it. I started a book, and so you can't copy this, folks. It's called Psst, okay? It's Psst. It's P-S-S-S-T, and it's, it has to do with marriage, right? Or if you're in a relationship, it's, and it has patience, you know, silence, Solitude, sacrifice, and uh, tolerance. Oh, cool! Okay. And everyone, and and, it, and you don't have to. It's it's a book where you so don't it's have. A, it's an acronym. Yeah, so you don't have. You do do not have to have like chapter one is this. You can pick anyone yeah. because every one of them has something to do. And I think sometimes in our life, this comes from my foundation, from growing up with my uncles in in Partizville and my mom and dad and my grandparents. Okay, my grandfather, which I loved, and my grandmother. Um, but you have, you know, why you should have patience. Sacrifice. Amen. Okay, people don't, sa they, they, everybody wants it today. They want every, especially young people getting married, they want it today. Yeah. Um, your, your thoughts on that? Well, there's no such thing uh, as microwave success. Yeah. Microwave, you know, uh, I heard a story about a guy uh, over in England. He, he invented a microwave fireplace. And when he, yeah. So when he took it to the patent office, they said, well, what do you do with it? He says, oh, with my invention, you can now spend the whole evening in front of the fire in just two minutes. That's nonsense. You have to have a life. Yeah. You have to go through the various stages in life. Once again, this is where the church is so good. The church has a church calendar. You progress through the year. Uh, you have rites of passage, whether whatever your denomination is, there's confirmation or communion or, or bar mitzvah. Uh, and... and you have to wait for those. You can't, ha you know, I want to be bar mitzvah now. I'm four. Can't happen. Yeah. And that waiting process gives us the time to fail, sometimes in a good situation. If you're in a good family, a loving parent will put her arm around you, his arm around you, and say, son, you failed, but, you know, you're I'm still, here. you're still, I'm here for you. Yeah. Mom's here for you. This goes back to your earlier question. Now, let me just go on record. A lot of people don't have that kind of structure anymore. That's sad. But the community, and this is why I love Hazleton. Hazleton is the one place where I have always felt if I was genuinely in need, genuinely, I could go knock on a door and say, look, I need a room, I need something to eat, can I stay here? 
And between you and me, I save a lot of money on hotels and motels when I come here because everybody is very kind to me in that and way. And you can come to my house anytime. Uh, before I go to break, uh, how important, Michael, is, is your fate to you? Well, it, it's, my, it's me. You look at me, you're looking. I was a renegade as a youngster. Mm -hmm. When I left Mother of Grace, I was angry at God. I did not want to talk to anybody about religion. I was actively working at being a sinner. And, of course, that means I was, no, I was a typical adolescent male. Mm -hmm. And I was just fortunate enough to be in a family where my, I was given space to make mistakes. I, I met and married a wonderful woman of, of tremendous faith, and uh, we brought all five of our children up to make decisions to have the same kind of faith. Nothing forced there. Never forced them to do anything. Folks, uh, Michael Apicella. You can uh, learn much more about him if you Google him. It's uh, michaelapicella.com, and that's A-P-I-C-H-E-L-L-A. -L -L -A. We come back, we'll talk about uh, his artistry. Stay with us. Welcome back to the Sam Hassan Show, folks. You know what's missing in our society, folks, today? Conversation. We're missing conversation. We're missing talking to people. We're, we're, we're doing this. We're, we're on the phone. We're texting. Well, even while we're sitting having dinner with people. And the person I'm talking today is Mike Apicella. He's an artist. He's a, a, an author. And he's, he was born and raised in Hazleton. And he delivers... Great conversation, is, and, and like I said, Mike, it's sad today because we're missing out on communicating with each other, you know, getting to see when you're talking to a person, if they're feeling pain, how could you help them? You can't do that when you're on a phone, and, you, and sometimes you, you mentioned about when I'm interviewing somebody, I really listen to them. I, I really do. This. Okay. I, I was going to say that. I, it, it's important because I learn. I, I, I learn about uh, different things. But, you know... Um, don't you find that you don't have that, that family gathering as much as they used to? In any way, even your friends. And, you know, in the olden days, like I said, there was porches. And people would be out there talking. And, and, and I think it's, it's important, don't you? I think it's very important. Incidentally, thank you for those kind things you said about me. I'm very grateful for that. It goes back to what I said to my daughter, though, Sam. You know, anybody watching this program today, tomorrow, could become the most popular person in his or her office or his or her circle if they simply do what you're doing here. When you're talking to somebody, there's a great story about an Irish immigrant who came to the United States just in time for the Civil War, right? Oh, right? And uh, you know, this is one of these kind of guys that would turn his lemons into lemonade. So he, he enlisted into, in the Union Army, and by dint of hard work and right place at, at right time, he was assigned to the White House. He was there with President Lincoln every day of the war because, as you might know, the Confederates cut down the lines of communication from Washington, D.C., so that if Lincoln wanted to send a message out to Grant, he had to send a personal emissary, yes. and that was this fella. I'll call him McGee, and I don't remember his name, but he was just a, you know, an ordinary Irish immigrant. And at the end of McGeehan's life, you know, he had spent the whole war in the presence of the greatest generals and the greatest leaders in the United States at the time. And uh, uh, the story goes, uh, in, in one, the penultimate chapter of the novel, he, he made this statement. He said, I, when, I met uh, when I met General Grant, I came away each time feeling as though I had met a truly great man. Oh, but when I met President Lincoln, he said there was never a time I came away when Lincoln hadn't met a great man. And the difference was, McGeehan would walk into the White House and Lincoln would say, McGeehan, how's your boy? He had a cold last time. Sit down. Have, you smoke cigars? Have a cigar. Have two cigars. How's your wife? Little conversation. And then he would say, and what does the good general have for me? Yes. Now, the corollary to that was, this is what he said, and I'm, I'm shortening this horribly. He would then get on his horse and he would ride for all he was worth through the Confederate uh, front lines to, to get to General Grant, who would usually be in the thick of it somewhere. And as soon as Grant would see him, McGee, get in here, quick! Get this back to the bar! Ooh, and off he was going. He didn't get a chance to go to the, to the bathroom. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Lincoln, though, never did that. Now, what I'm saying in response to your question is simply take time to do what you're doing. Yeah. Make eye contact. Yeah. If, if, if it's appropriate, touch, touch a, a, a back of a hand. Mm -hmm. And you know, psychology teaches this. Ever, if you took a baby and raised a baby without ever once giving it eye contact and touching it, it would act like a wolf. It would not be human fully. And so simply take time tomorrow at work and listen to people before you get down to business. And you will find not only will you communicate better, you will become more popular, you will probably feel happier in, in yourself, 
And if this person happens to be working for you, you will win that person's loyalty. And you know, because if you don't have your worker's loyalty, you can't retain them. And if you can't retain them, you're a bum. You know what we're missing in society, which our parents had and our friends had, my relatives had? Your mother has this. It's common sense. Uh, I don't, I'm not sure I have that, but I common take your sense point. That, take you your know, point. My, my grandfather, and, uh, had, and my father, and my, they had a doctor's degree in common sense. Yeah, okay? yeah, yeah. And, and University of Life. I, I, it's a good university. Hard to get into. E yes, it is. Yes, it is. And that's the thing that I think it's, it's so, so sad we're missing. Hey, Michael, I, I enjoy this conversation. I really do. Not I wish as much I, as I am. I, I wish I could go on and on. You're a great guy, seriously. <laughs> uh, I, I'm, I'm, I would love to meet your, meet your wife. Um, <clears throat> I wish Next you, trip, I'm going to bring <clears throat> my wife please, with uh, me. Stop by, and uh, I give the best to your children. How very kind Do you have any you. grandchildren? No, not yet. Uh, I got started wait a little later. Wait till they come. I'm already, uh, I'm there, I'm there, Sam. Yeah, I'm looking forward come. to it. I'm going to reinvent myself uh, okay. as a grandpa. Folks, Michael Apicella, believe me, go to his website, Michael Apicella. We didn't get a chance to talk about his artistry, but however, um, there's a, a lot of information that, that you can learn, uh, and it's great information. Uh, we'll see you next time.